age. And the S was the German, the German reason for that. Um, the Welshes do, did come through Ellis Island and travel through Lancaster, you know, the whole Pennsylvania Dutch type thing, and then landed in New Middletown. So the first time that you really see the Welsh family, they are going to be in New Middletown, and it's going to be um, Ezra. And Ezra was partners um, in the Wire Welsh Distillery, and the Welshes were whiskey makers. And where the Golden Rye Grill is now currently, a lot of that memorabilia, memorabilia excuse me, was shared by... Um, my dad and, you know, and the Welsh family and that history is there. So, uh, the house next door, which is still a beautiful home with the wraparound porch, all stone, brick, that was Ezra Welsh's, um, home. Uh, the, the my great-grandfather, which was Duncan Welsh, was also involved in that. And then when Prohibition came, obviously the Welshes had no jobs. So um, Ezra moved the distillery to Ontario, Canada, across the river from Detroit. But um, Duncan and his children, and his children were um, Herman, Wayne, and May, all decided to stay in New Springfield. And um, Duncan's home was actually where Doug Bear lives, if anyone's familiar with that house in New Springfield. And then um, Nana and Pop Pop, Wayne and Edith were across the street and eventually uh, built the brick home up at Garfield Road. But um, when the Welshes moved to New Springfield, that was kind of an in-between type thing. They didn't know what they were going to do to um, make money. And in the tradition of the Welsh family, we, we will see that there's entrepreneurs in, in each generation of that family. Just for um, the connections, um, my great-grandfather Duncan, his wife was a Kaufman. Um, my uncle Herman, his wife was a Lip. Um, my papa and, and Nana, Wayne and Edith, Edith was a Miller. My mom and dad, mom was a DeRodes. And so we have some De DeRodes family here today too. <laughs> and then obviously my husband was Tom Coke. So kind of get a, get a feel for the whole Springfield Township <laughs> through the Kaufman, Lip, Miller, Coke names, but that's kind of what we did. Um, in 1988, my sister was at the Ohio State University, and one of her projects was um, to talk about, or was in business history. And the things that I'm going to share with you were memories that Dad shared with Brenda for this for this project. And it starts out, service is our business. A service-oriented policy has been the means of survival for Welsh Motors through four generations. The dealership's prosperity has resulted from off offering personalized service, a commitment to customer satisfaction, and community support. Located in a small town in the township with population only amounting to 5,920 people according to the 1980 Bureau Census, family service has been a necessary niche for us. Just as Henry Ford II had his heritage in the automobile business, so have the four generations of the Welshes. Personally speaking, and again, this is my sister Brenda speaking, family pride and a predict, an appreciation of her own livelihood 
are the reasons this company deserves to be studied. However, for others, the company history exemplifies the continued experience <coughs> of perpetual business in a modern society. And I'm going to pause here. Um, in 1939, when Welsh Motors was started, people didn't, didn't travel. I mean, so you, you know the niche. And um, the Welshes are, are and still are Lutherans. So at one time, there were three Lutheran churches in this township. And um, so when you think about this car business in 1939, and, and this will feed into the whole 83 years of history, but you have to remember about how things were changing because people weren't traveling that far. Um, the hi company's history exemplifies the continuing existence in the modern society. The dealership is typical of all small business in a retail establishment and a well-defined niche market. Additionally, the franchise itself has supported the dealership's presence in its perpetual form. Prior to 1939, the dealership was owned by William Geiger and called Geiger Motors. Geiger opened the dealership in 1918, and it was one of the very first Ford franchises. At the time of his death, Duncan Welsh, who was our first president of Welsh Motors, was a salesman at that dealership. Again, after the end of the whiskey making business, this is when we, we see Duncan again. Ralph Ash was the head mechanic, and Wayne Welsh, Duncan's son, operated the Geiger farm. Since the Geiger's widow, nor son lacked interest in the dealership or the farm, they sold both. <clears throat> Due to Duncan and Ash's interest in the dealership and Wayne's previous experience operating a service station and farming, the three formed a partnership and purchased the business, renaming it Welsh Ash Ford. Financing was obtained from John Barger, a local manufacturer of fruit and vegetable baskets, at an annual interest rate of 3%, <laughs> and was secured by the property and life insurance policies with John Barger listed as the beneficiary. In 1939, <laughs> at age 45, Duncan Welsh was the sales manor, manager and operated the office. At 23, Wayne took care of service and tractor sales, and Ash handled service and parts, and they employed two mechanics. The product lines handled at this time included Ford cars, trucks, tractors, farm machinery, and shell petroleum products. An additional aspect of the business was a transportation company which provided busing for Springfield Local School District. In 1940, so less than one year later, so I guess we can still claim 1939 as our business, Ash withdrew from the partnership and the dealership became known as Welsh Motors. When the United States entered war in World War II in 1941, Ford, like many other manufacturers of this time period, adopted their facilities to build products to defend the country. Without new products available to the dealership, the only source of income was used vehicles sales and used vehicle sales, service and parts. As a result, Welsh Motors became very service oriented. During this early stage, it was the only means of survival. 
The post-war <laughs> period brought several changes to the organization of the business. The first change came when Herman Welsh, Duncan's other son, returned from the war and became a partner in the business. Second, as a result of Ford buying Ferguson's interest in the farm equipment division, Ford Motor Company separated vehicles and farm equipment. The Welshes were forced to choose one franchise or the other. The dealership decided to forfeit their farm equipment franchise. The economic conditions in this area promoted this choice. First, local farms were small. Second, many farmers worked part-time in Youngstown steel mills due to the excellent employment opportunities. Third, men returning from the war also sought employment in the steel industry rather than <clears throat> returning to the farms. Fourth, teenagers generally left the farm seeking other possible income and needed transportation to and from work. The trends of the time supported the decision for the Welshes to keep the vehicle franchise. The third change in the organization of the business was the result of the availability of new products and general growth of the United States economy after the war. The dealership expanded their parts department, built additional bays for the service department, remodeled their showroom, and provided a bookkeeping service. The other thing that I remember that isn't in here, we sold license plates for years and years, and that's where you came to Welsh Motors to get your license plates. But it, it wasn't recorded in this history, that's my memory. <laughs> so as a result of this expansion, additional employees were hired, namely a full-time bookkeeper, a full-time parts manager, and an additional mechanic. The remodeling and expansion were financed through First National Bank of East Palestine. Also interesting with all the bank changes and <laughs> consolidation. A floor plan, which is an open line of credit for the purchase of vehicles from the manufacturer, was also established. Welsh Motors was one of the first uh, Ford dealerships that well, Ford Motor Credit had just started, and Welsh Motors was one of the first dealerships. And after 50 years, and we, we don't have a picture of it, um, but after 50 years, uh, Ford Motor Credit did come and present um, Dad with an award for being one of the very first dealerships with Ford Motor Credit. And we did use Ford Motor Credit right up until we closed in in 2022. Um, typical of the post-war era and economic environment, so did the business itself change. In 1949, Herman left the business due to personal conflicts. And we'll find um, over the years, and you'll kind of see this a little bit later in the talk, um, there, there were many people who were hired to work at Welsh Motors and many people who were given opportunities that were part of our family or our extended family. I'm blessed today to have my Uncle Frank and my cousin Patty. Um, like myself, they were long-termers at Welsh Motors, you know. <laughs> we were the ones that started out um, pushing the broom, washing the cars, and just kind of moved up. But over the years, there, there, there were other family members that, that brought, brought things to Welsh Motors that greatly benefited the history of our company. But there was also those of us who, who remained with Welsh Motors. So um, anyhow, when Herman left, that's when it left Duncan and Wayne as the co-owners. And Duncan was still the president um, until later on. 
Uh, during the same year, the transportation company was terminated because of the result of the Springfield Local Board of Education. That we retained the contract to service the buses, but at that point, the school purchased their own school buses. So we no longer own school buses after that time. During the next few years, sales increased and Ford began manufacturing vehicles with thinner, less durable metals. By 1956, the growing demand for body repairs made it necessary to expand services in this area. And Cliff Grosson was, the, was in the body shop for all of his working career, I think. Don't you, John? Pretty close. <laughs> Pretty close, yeah. yeah, yeah. The building that was previously used to house buses for the transportation company was converted um, into a body shop and that full-time body man, Cliff Grosson, was hired. In 1958, Wayne, Larry Welsh, Wayne's son, bought Duncan's share in the partnership. It really doesn't say at what point um, Wayne, uh, Duncan was president and then Wayne, but they, they both were president at, at some point there. We just don't have a real clear year timeline on that. But in 1958, Dad did become the president and he bought Duncan's share. The first couple of factors that promoted this change in partnership first, Larry had graduated from The Ohio State University and found limited job opportunities Due, due to the country's current economic state of recession. Second, Duncan, now 64 years of age, wished to retire. Larry's share of the partnership was financed with a personal loan from Duncan to re, be repaid in annual installments to, re, to support his retirement. At this time, Wayne was the dealer and sales manager, and Larry handled the parts and service department. Three years later, they enlarged the showroom, built another new parts department, and hired Lee McCormick, Wayne's son-in-law, as a salesman. Lee McCormick will have a short history um, at Welsh Motors. He was married to uh, my Aunt Pat, which is my dad's sister. Um, but you will see pictures uh, of from an old chronicle where they were in pictures. So we, we do have pictures of Pat and Lee. In the early 60s, the Consumer Society continued to grow and accordingly, consumer products flooded the market. Consistent with the trends of the period, the dealership continued to grow and significantly increased sales meant increased inventory and additional space was needed. The growing service department also pressed for space. In 1963, two parcels of adjoining property became available. The business quickly purchased them. The church building on one plot was moved to the other, and that was the Church of God. Um, and the other converted into a service station. The, re the remain parcel was, cons was converted into a used car lot. And there's a picture of the house moving, and you could see the expansion of the car lot. And then, so, Additional altercation, additional alternatives resulted from this expansion. First, the shell business was moved into the service station, ultimately completely separating it from the dealership. Second, fast service items such as shakes, shocks, brakes, lubrication were moved into the service station, allowing the service department to do major service repairs. 
third, an additional bookkeeper was hired to handle the additional volume created by the service station. Fourth, the, employee, the company hired additional employees to staff the service station, which now operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Fifth, a record service was established with AAA and U-Haul rentals. The second mortgage of the existing property was also through First National Bank of East Palestine and provided necessary financing. However, due to the limited lending powers of the bank, it was necessary to also borrow from Ford Motor Credit. As a result of the ever dynamic environment of business, this diversification was short-lived. In 1966, Wayne retired due to illness and it became apparent that that reorganization would be the only means of survival. First, Wayne's retirement meant Larry's responsibilities moved from parts and service to, as to assist in sales and overall management. This made it necessary to hire a full-time service manager. Second, the fact that the service station had not been profitable and qualified dependable employees were difficult to find. This led to leasing the service station to an independent operator. This marked the end of the petroleum business. Consequently, the office staff was reduced to one bookkeeper uh, because of the reduced volume. Third, Lee McCormick left after five years of service as a salesman. Finally, due to Duncan's death and the pressure from the family on notes, the business was re refinanced again through First National Bank of East Palestine. The centralization of operations ne necessary for a tremendous loss in the service-oriented base that had kept this business alive forever. There are main factors in the financial recovery of Welsh Motors over these few years. As sales grew and management responsibilities became more demanding, Larry hired a salesman, Frank DeRose, and an additional office person. Keeping with the idea of a family-oriented business, the new salesman, Larry's brother-in-law, and the new bookkeeper was his wife, Jean. Throughout the 60s and 70s, <coughs> government regulation had a significant impact on Welsh Motors. In 1966, the National Highway Traffic Safety Board was established to regulate the automobile business and the two regulations having the biggest impact on the automotive industry were the Clean Air Act in 1970 and the Energy Policy Conservation in 1975. Additionally, Ford Motor Company's exposure to product, to product liability drastically increased. Sequentially, gross profits came, gross profits declined. Um, one year later, the company continued to find new diversity in the formation of L&J Insurance. L&J Insurance would handle finance and insurance for sales. By 1979, American firms only produced 16% of the world's steel. And just at that time, we see the, clothing, the closing of the Youngstown steel mills. They were closing in 1978 and 79, which led to yet again another recession. Although total profits of the dealership decreased, 
parts and service sales increased from 1977. Once again, service provided the lifeline and anchor <coughs> through this storm. This made the expansion in the dealership possible. Additional bays were added, adjoining land purchased, and additional, uh, and additional, additional employees were, were added, and also an additional body man. This expansion was financed through a personal loan from Jean and Larry Welsh. The first of the fourth generation to join Welsh Motors was Larry's oldest daughter, hired full-time in sales in 1985. But let me tell you, <laughs> I remember sitting on a plastic bucket <laughs> in the service department while Dad worked on cars. And um, anyone that was involved in my life knows that um, I, w I was there all my life, even older when I'd have other jobs, uh, part-time during school. Um, I was that girl that washed school bus windows to get ready for school bus inspection um, and all those good things. So um, 1985 is my first official hire day, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, it, but it was way back before then. Although I will have to say I went to Pyatt Street Market with Grandma DeRose <laughs> and picked in the field. It kind of depended on which family needed, needed the help the most. <laughs> uh, in 1988, the company converted the present body shop into new and used vehicle preparation um, area because the idea to build a new body shop was completely out of the question financially. In summary, um, Brenda says she'd like to re-emphasize the ways that Welsh Motors had to adapt to the changing client, climate. By being aware of economic and social changes and being able to modify what they offered also, the goodwill for the company was promoted through the community by the philanthropy measures by supplying things like a car to Springfield for the driver's ed program, serving on community committees to promote school bond issues, providing a van to the Youngstown Shrine Club to transport um, children to the hospital in Erie and Cincinnati. Um, due to the company's historical ability to solve and note with these changes and move along with a strong family focus. The integrity of the company has always been uh, the company's ideal of personalized service. So that was probably the best history. Um, there was also, um, when we had the, the Middletown postmark, for many of you to, I really think that um, they wrote a great business, or a great uh, article about our business that, that felt, you know, really heartwarming, and, and yet they really covered everything, and I won't, read it all, but just some highlights. The year was 1939, FDR was president, and the current box office hit was Gone with the Wind. It was Big Band and the Sounds of the Time. Um, we go down, we've talked about them buying and everything, but it just goes on to talk about how, influ how much influence there was always between um, Welsh Motors and the Springfield local schools working back and forth and how it was really part of the Welsh history. Um, it also goes on to talk about at one point 
the Welsh family had to figure out ways of income and provided custom farming. It was a term used as a service to other farmers. The services provided thrashing, plowing, and combining. So you can see they, they were, they, they, they got their hands a little bit and everything so that they could, that they could survive. And the article, this article also talks about my sister Brenda Folkenroth joining the business. Um, the 90s, again, were a time of change. And as we, this is the first picture. And as we, as we look through and, and look at the pictures and everything that's changed, you'll see that there were a lot of awards given, which, I mean, you, I, during my lifetime, it's always been like, oh, you're just a small town, you know. <laughs> what about those big stores, you know? What about, but um, when you do see all the accolades that were awarded, it, it, it really makes an impression on, on, what, on what actually happened in this history. There's also a picture of the 1939 coupe and that was originally purchased by Vida Floor of Petersburg in 1939, and it was purchased from Duncan and Wayne Welsh during their first year of sale. Rumor has it in our memory, we think it was the third car they sold, or some, some number like that. It was later owned by Henry Withers, the local Farm Bureau insurance agent, and purchased by Larry and Jean Welsh in 1970. The 1939 coupe now has its home at the Coke Farm, which is 100 years old. <laughs> and um, I, I'm actually the last Coke standing at the farm, but um, my mother-in-law, Vivian, will be 100 years old on um, November 17th. So. So, although I'm the last Coke on the farm, uh, she did leave there, I'm going to say maybe five years ago, uh, five to seven years ago, and did go over to assisted living. So, um, just kind of um, the interesting things, that there are, every one of these articles always goes back to the same thing, that no matter what no matter what, every they just kept coming up with with ways to <coughs> redevelop themselves to create income. But yet, the Ford franchise was the that was the foundation and the thing that that held them together. Um, when we talk about um, the community involvement, just <coughs> a, a couple of things during the '60s and '70s. Welsh Motors <laughs> sponsored Punt Pass and Kick. Uh, later on, we were involved in Drive One for Your School to support the athletic and the music programs. Uh, the year that we did Drive One for Your School, there was over $13,000 raised for um, both of those departments. Um, always an appreciation of our loyal customers we were able to support the community through various donations. Um, donated the car for the daycare program, donated all the service and maintenance, uh, supported the firemen and EMS dinners, Boy Scout pasta, um, St. Paul's Altar Guild dinner, National Night Out, soccer, 4-H um, livestock, Little League, <laughs> Yearbook, Lions Club, VFW, Community Food Basket, Relay for Life, um, the Springfield uh, Football Stadium. Actually, there that it has uh, two projects. One project was Dad's donation early on, and there is a plaque there um, from the Welsh family. And if I remember right, I think he donated the visitor's side 
and the press box. Yeah, yeah Jeff, Jeff Dyer shaking his head. <laughs> and then um, recently, uh, Welsh Motors also contributed to the new turf project. So if you see the new turf project at the school, Welsh Motors was also a part of that. And then the Canfield Fair 4-H Coliseum, which 4-H was near and dear to both my heart and Tom's heart. Although those chickens that I had, I hated that my mother had me do for projects and they pecked me to death. And then I married a man who had 70,000 laying hens. So my mother never let me forget forget that but yeah welsh motors was involved in in that new wonderful building for 4-h and i mean we could go on and on but um welsh motors and our employees are we can't we can't say enough about our employees were involved in everything um i you know just every type of a committee or anything in the community you know, we can, we can never say enough, but our customers and this community is what made Welsh Motors last from 1939 to 2022. And kind of wrapping up um, for anyone who, who didn't see it, these were my final words. <laughs> and, and then after I will answer any questions, oh, and I'm sorry, I did miss one. Um, this letter I do have to share. Um, when Dad, Larry Welsh, passed, passed away in 2016, we received this letter from Bill Ford. So I, I have to share this. Um, it's addressed to Mrs. Kimberly Welsh Co., Miss, Mrs. Brenda Folkenroth, and Mr. Larry Haig. On behalf of all the men and women of Ford Motor Company, please accept our heartfelt sympathy on the sudden passing of Larry Welsh. As your father, Kim and Brenda, and your grandfather, Larry, he surely was proud of your accomplishments. I understand that his devotion to his family, faith, and community was an inspiration to everyone who knew him and that he touched many lives with his kindness and compassion. Larry represented Ford Motor Company in an exemplary manner and was an excellent business partner. I sincerely appreciate his and your unwavering dedication to serving Welsh Motors customers and Ford Motor Company. Words cannot cease the ease of pain. I know you are feeling badly today, but I hope you'll find comfort in knowing that the legacies of Larry, Wayne, and Duncan live on through the fine work you three are doing at Welsh Motors. My thoughts and prayers are with you and the entire Welsh family at this sad time. Signed, Bill Ford, and that's William Clay Ford, Jr., Executive Chairman of Ford Motor Company. Yeah, yeah, so that, I, I, I almost flipped through that, but that was important. So, so what happened? Well, um, none of my children were really interested in continuing Welsh Motors, and in, oh, well, in 2020, when the world shut down and we honestly didn't know and, and became an essential business, basically I became, God bless Niesel's Hardware, they, they gave me the carpet scrubber and I became a cleaning lady going to work in my sweats and disinfecting and I would scrub the carpet from one end and when I'd get to done, scrub it again. And, Every day we waited for the governor at two o'clock to tell us, so we, so I could tell our employees what was going to happen the next day. So, and I wasn't young anymore, and Dad had been gone about five or six years. Tom will actually be gone twelve years in April, and I thought, what are you doing? 
You know, what are you doing compounding your hair? But then I thought, oh, the Welshes work at least till they're 70. You know, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> so a um, couple years later, I had two people come and want to buy Welsh Motors. And um, because it's a Ford franchise, you, you don't make that decision alone. You have to make a presentation and it has to go to Detroit and Detroit. They have to offer, they have to um, approve these people. Well, when I went to Detroit, they said, well, Cam, we'd like to come back with a third offer. They said, once again, what I had talked about earlier, you know, in 1939, we needed a Ford dealer here, there, everywhere. We don't need all these Ford dealers anymore. You know, you're, everybody's on top of each other. So we'd like to buy back your franchise. But you would have to um, sell your building and you have to sell all your vehicles and your parts and everything. And I thought, well, you know what? I could probably do that. Dad taught me how to do that when I had to sell all the equipment and everything from Coke Farm when Tom died. So I'd been around auctions, well, actually a lot longer than that because I think Dad was the executor of everybody's everything and we, he drugged Brenda and I along to do plenty of auctions. So I spoke with the attorney, um, in Columbus who, who specialized in Ford franchise things and he said I don't know Kim I said well I don't know now if I'm ready to retire he said I think you better be <laughs> <laughs> he said this is a pretty good offer so that was an emotional decision but I, uh, I can honestly tell all of you that um I talked to my sister, all, both of my sisters, both Kathy and Brenda, although Kathy was never involved in the business. And we talked about it and I was like, you know, I'm really at peace with this decision. I really think the world has changed enough that, that it is time. And I, I don't think that um, my great grandfather Duncan, or my grandfather Wayne, or my dad Larry, would be mad at me for making this decision. Um, and I became president in 2002, right at the time of Tom's death. So, I mean, it was kind of, the burden had been on me. And then there I am, a young widow, 54, you know, and had the burden of, so I, the more I thought about it, so in the end, this is what I wrote. These were my last years. For 83 years, the Welsh Motor Motors has traveled this road. With all our customers, employee, family, and friends, we have rep represented Ford Motor Company and tried to promote the highest level of customer service available. This road began in 1939. When Wayne and Duncan, when Duncan and Wayne, father and son, purchased a Ford franchise. They already had a few school buses and were providing transportation to Springfield local students. The Welsh fam family previously was partners in the Wire Welsh Distillery, producing Middletown Golden Rye. Prohibition came in 1920 and lasted until 1933. The Great Depression lasted from 1929 to 1939. This was Duncan and Wayne's big chance to continue the Welsh family's entrepreneurship. In 1958, following his graduation from The Ohio State University, Larry Welsh joined his father and grandfather. Also that year, Larry and Jean's oldest daughter, Kim, was born. Kim was the first of three, followed by Kathy and Brenda. Wayne retired in 1969, and Larry became the president of Welsh Motors. His wife, Jean DeRoge, Jean DeRoge Welsh, became the secretary treasurer. Larry remained active in Welsh Motors until his passing in 2016. 
After growing up at Walsh Motors and working part-time with our parents, Kim became a full-time employee in 1986 and Brenda in 1989. In 2012, Kim became the president. Effective November 1st, 2022, Welsh Motors will close due to Kim's retirement. Ford Motor Company will no longer be represented in New Springfield, Ohio. This road has been truly amazing. A journey of many winding roads, hills, and valleys. The Welsh family has been truly blessed by all of our customers, employee, family, and friends. Thank you. Truly a heartfelt thank you. Our family serving your family from 1939 till 2022. And probably the greatest award of all I'm gonna finish with. And when I was cleaning out and doing, I found this card. And this card is from Joanne Ellis retired high, Springfield High School school teacher. And I'm sure many of you had Mrs. Ellis or remembered Mrs. Ellis, but she said, when you have a student in high school, you don't always realize the great things they will achieve. And in honor of that, and we have a picture of that, this is our proudest award. And I know there are not many of these. Zonda may know how many there are, but there's not, not very many. So thank you, and this is our proudest award. All the acclimates from Ford, we honestly love them, but, but this one really, I wish Dad was alive to get this one. He, oh, he's, oh, he has. Zonda said he's seen it already. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you. And if anybody has any questions or memories, Pat or Uncle Frank, if you'd like to share. David, you have yes. a question? Okay. Yeah, one thing you didn't mention. Uh oh. Is that Duncan and Wayne, the charter members of the new Springfield Volunteer Fire Department. Yes, they In were. In the first two years of the existence of the fire department, the building that later became the body shop was the first fire station before they built the, the next station where the present station 23 is across okay. the street. And we also had a fire phone in the front room. Okay. And your grandmother, Edith, answered the call from the while was open. Yeah. And they were closed. My mother answered the fire phone at our house. Okay. <laughs> Very good. That's a good part of Walsh's history. They, we're real good to the fire department. Well, thank you. And I know when I first came in, I said to Carrie Snyder, should I talk about my Nana, Edith Welsh, going to your house and getting her hair done? So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, another one. <laughs> Uncle Frank, do you have something you'd like to add? Or? Well, you covered it pretty good. <laughs> I, uh, I lucked out because when I got out of the army, Stand up. Larry called me and, uh, and said we have to talk. And uh, when I went to talk, why I changed the whole direction that I was going and took a job with him. <laughs> that changed the whole direction of my life. <laughs> and uh, it was a, an experience that I probably would not have survived in big dealerships or somewhere else because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been satisfied just selling a car. Uh, I did lots of things there that I couldn't have done anywhere else, from selling school buses and fire trucks and, and buses with Supreme Bus Corporation out of Indiana that wouldn't have happened at any other place besides selling the cars. But uh, he gave me an opportunity that lasted me a lifetime. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the picture of the snow plow, that's Sanford three and anybody who knew my dad as snowplow always had a name and there was Sanford one and Sanford two well uncle Frank had retired and I had purchased Sanford three because snow plowing was going to be my job and I wasn't doing it in that old track <laughs> but um, the first year after uncle Frank retired 
oh, we had a horrible, horrible snow. And I called, and I was trying to get us dug out, and I called, and I said, Uncle Frank, could you and Uncle Bruce please come again and help me with this <laughs> and, and I think Uncle Frank really enjoyed Sanford Three because he came to, uh, several other times. And <laughs> he'd run the plow so I could run the tractor. <laughs> and Patty, do you want to say how you started? <laughs> Well, I came to work, I worked under, I was there 20 some years, I came to work under Uncle Larry, and then I worked under Kim. Uh, I worked in the office with my Aunt Jean, who, thank God, she taught me bookkeeping, and probably anywhere else I would have gone, I would have had to have an accounting degree, but she taught me everything I needed, and by the time I was done, I had an accounting degree. <laughs> I actually took Brenda's job because she was going to Baltimore to live with Jim, and uh, then when Brenda decided to come back, uh, they kept me, and Brenda and I both worked in the office. So it was an absolutely great experience. Absolutely great. And I, and I know many, and I do keep in touch, but I know many, uh, Many employees share that same thing about working for the Welsh family. So, do we have any more questions?